Hey everybody, this is Professor Mankowski. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at what the central limit theorem is. We're gonna see what it looks like, how it's helpful to us, and then start to work some conceptual examples of it. And the central limit theorem is gonna be something that drives most of everything else we do for the rest of the semester. So it's one of the most important concepts we're gonna hit during the whole term. So what does it say? If we know a little something about a population, and it doesn't matter what the population is, it doesn't matter what it looks like, if it's uh, data that's skewed right, skewed left, bimodal, trimodal, you name it, as long as we know the average and the standard deviation of the population, we can take a sample out of the population and we can use the central limit theorem to analyze the behavior of the sample. Now, it kind of presents us with a problem, too, because in real life, we're never really going to know anything about the population. So it's a little strange to assume that we're going to know sigma and we're going to know the mu population average. So how exactly do we do this? And the answer is, statisticians said, well, we really won't know anything about the population, but we can always take a sample from the population. So if the central limit theorem works going forward, then maybe it'll work going in reverse. And that's where the real heavy lifting is. So what's gonna happen is in chapter six, we're gonna be going forward with the green arrows. We're gonna learn how to analyze the probability of a sample average, given what we know about population information. And in chapter seven, we're gonna go in reverse. We're gonna do the heavy lifting. We're gonna learn how to draw a sample out of a population and use what we're seeing in the sample to make generalizations about what's happening in the population. So first of all, what does the central limit theorem actually say? The first thing it says is if we were to go and take an infinite sample, uh, rather infinite amount of samples of the same size, sample and from the population, and for each sample, we take the average of whatever it is that we're recording information on maybe the average amount of um, chocolate bars somebody eats in one year. So if we go ahead and we look at the sample average for every single sample that we took, it's gonna turn out that the averages will conform to a normal distribution. So it doesn't matter what the data looks like that you started with, the averages are always gonna end up conforming to a normal distribution. And we know that a normal distribution has two parameters. It has an average and a standard deviation. What's gonna happen is if we take all of our sample averages and we calculate the average of all the averages, we're gonna get back exactly the population average mu. If we take all the sample averages and we calculate the standard deviation of all those, we're gonna get the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. Now, the only catch that we need to make sure of to get the central limit theorem work is we have to make sure our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, and if not, the data must be normally distributed, or we can't use the central limit theorem. So what we're going to do is take a closer look at our two terms that we have in uh, red here, because that's going to make up probably the most important parts of the whole entire central limit theorem. So really helpful to know how the formula is gonna be working because we're gonna be using it so much for the rest of the term. So let's take a close look with an example. If the average person uses about 130 gallons of water a day, as in they consume it, uh, showers, washing the car, brushing the teeth, uh, drinking water, total is about 130, uh, rather the average is about 130 gallons a day. And if the water consumption is normally distributed, then we get start to do a sketch, a normal distribution sketch. And in the center, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna place 130 gallons. Now, if we go into the population and we start taking averages of maybe um, sample size, or rather we take samples of size 40 out of that population, and we start calculating the average of each sample, we don't expect the sample average to be exactly equal to the population average, and that's because of something called sampling error. Sampling error means a sample is just that. It's a sample. It's never gonna have everybody in it that the population does, so we can't expect our sample average to be exactly equal to the population average. There's gonna be a little bit of give and take in there. So if we have our first sample of uh, 40 people from the population, Maybe we find out that our sample average is a little higher than the population average, perhaps about 133 gallons. The next time we do the sample, our sample average is 
just about 130 gallons. And then we draw another sample of 40 people. And uh, now we have two instances of a little bit above 130 gallons. We go ahead, we take another sample and we have now two samples of 130 gallons. And we take a third sample or rather a uh, fifth sample of 40 people. And this time the sample average is a little bit lower than 130 gallons, maybe about 128. And we do this again and again and again, over and over again. Uh, now three uh, sample averages that were about 130 gallons. So what's gonna happen is if we do this procedure over and over, tons and tons of times, it's gonna to start to look something like this. And if we look at the shape of all the sample averages, we would probably say, oh my goodness, this is a normal distribution. Wrong. <laughs> but it's approximately normally distributed, which is good enough, it's close enough for us to start doing some preliminary probability. Now, the important part that we wanna see in here is if we look at the average of all the sample averages, meaning if we took each X bar, we added them all together and then divided by the total number to get the average of all the X bars, it would be exactly equal to the population average mu. And this seems to make sense because if we look at what number is right in the middle of the distribution, we see it peaking at 130 gallons. And the standard deviation of all the averages, if we were to calculate the standard deviation of every single X bar, it would be exactly equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit closer of a look at how come we're dividing sigma by the square root of n, since we've never really seen that before. And what's happening is when we take a look at the distribution of sample averages, and we have a line superimposed over the silhouette, we notice that line is shaped very differently than the normal distribution curve in black behind it. When we're looking at the distribution of sample averages, they all seem to be kind of crushed up around the population average mu, meaning they're converging around 130 gallons very, very closely. Now, why is that happening? Here's why. Would we think it would be more difficult to find one person that's consuming an excessively high usage of water each day, like somebody that's in the shower with this crazy system or like eight shower heads are using like 200 gallons of water for each shower? Or would it be harder to find a whole entire sample of maybe 3,000 people that were averaging a ridiculously high amount of water usage? Now, which one do you think it would be? Is it gonna be hard, harder to find one person that's averaging like, 300 gallons of water, or I mean one person that's using 300 gallons of water, or a whole entire sample of 3,000 people that's averaging 300 gallons of water. Now the answer is it's going to be a lot harder to find a whole sample of people doing that because on a random unbiased sample we'd have to find like 3,000 people that were all using an outrageously high quantity of water each day. That's going to be very hard to do. And that's why the sample averages are converging so closely to the population average. We're just not as likely to get a very high, ultra high sample average or a very low sample average. And that's why the standard deviation of the distribution of averages is so much tighter than the normal distribution line fitting curve. And that's precisely why when we calculate the standard deviation of the distribution of averages, we're dividing by the square root of our sample size because we have to recognize that that standard deviation is getting smaller. And if we divide something, we make it smaller. So it's kind of like our correction factor. Okay, so let's talk about what formula we're gonna use for the central limit theorem. Since we know this involves a normal distribution, we already have a formula that works for a normal distribution that we've seen before. We're gonna take that and we're gonna modify it to get it to work for the central limit theorem. So we're gonna print up on our screen the same z-score formula that we're always used to seeing, and now we're gonna to start to modify it to get it to work for the central limit theorem. So we're gonna set up for z equals, and we're gonna take our x and we're gonna convert it to an x bar, because after all, now we're analyzing the behavior of sample averages, aren't we? Our mu is gonna still stay situated in the numerator because we're comparing the sample average to population averages. Uh, rather to the population average. 
And on the denominator, we're going to take our sigma, and now we're going to divide it by the square root of n. And that's going to leave us with the formula, the modified formula we're going to use for our central limit theorem. Now, how do you know which formula to use at what time? Well, the simplest way to think about it is if you need to use a central limit theorem formula, the question is going to look very, very similar to all the other questions we've been doing in chapter six so far. The difference is they're going to have to give us a sample size, and they're going to have to mention something about a sample average. That's how we can tell that it's time to use the central limit theorem formula. So let's go ahead right away. Let's take an example of one. Um, pause the video for a couple minutes if you need to read through the question. Okay. So as we're reading through the question, what's the most important thing that we're noticing in the question? Do you think it's the population average or the standard deviation or uh, maybe the sample size? What do you think it is? Now the answer is uh, even easier than that. At first, we just wanna know, can we solve the question? And what this is getting at is we talked about two different checkpoints that we have to make sure are happening before we go ahead and use the central limit theorem formula. Now, one of those is our data needs to come from a normal distribution. And if we look inside the question, we don't see any mention about normal distribution anywhere. So is it still okay to use the central limit theorem? And the next qualification is if we're not seeing anything about normally distributed, then we would have to make sure the sample size is greater than 30. And when we look in the question here, we've definitely got it case that our sample size is greater than 30. It's holding at 36. So now we're in good shape. We know that our distribution of averages is going to conform to a normal distribution. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to sketch in a normal distribution curve. Now, as far as how to label this, there's a lot of numbers they gave me in the question. So to get everything straight before I start labeling, I'm just going to write down all the numbers that they gave me. And I'm going to start to put symbols to each number. If I look to try to identify the 26,489, inside the question, it seems like that's mentioned in the context of the word mean or average. Now, what I have to decide is, is that 26,489 the population average mu, or is it the sample average x bar? Now, I can figure that out by trying to find out where else they've mentioned an average in the question. And it looks like uh, down in the last line, they're mentioning a mean cost of $26,000. So which one is the sample average? Which one is the population average? And my big clue is that the 26,000 is mentioned in conjunction with what's happening when we take the sample of 36 schools. And that's enough information to tell me that the 26,000 must be my X bar. Therefore, 26,489 would have to be my population average mu. So I'm gonna go ahead and label my mu and my X bar. And I'm also going to go ahead and put that 26,489 in the center of the curve because now I know that that's my population average. For my sample size, I can go ahead and label that 36 is now my N. And 3,204 is the last number left to identify. I look up in the question and that's written along with the population standard deviation. So that tells me that 3,204 must be my sigma symbol. So now that I have everything labeled, I'm gonna to start to finish off my curve sketch. I'm gonna take my sample average and I'm gonna put that arbitrarily to the left of the population average, 26,000. And I also found out by reading the question that I need to do a greater than probability. So I'm gonna go into my normal distribution curve and I'm gonna shade all the area greater than 26,000 because that's the area I have to find in my Z curve, rather my Z table. Now, as I start to fill this out, I'm going to bring my Z formula up on the screen. And I'm going to start to put in all the digits where they need to go. And this is going to come out to be my Z is negative 0.92. And be careful, this is not a probability yet. All we know is that our 26,000 was situated 0.92 standard deviations below the mean. So to find the probability, we have to take the negative 0.92, we have to look it up in the Z table. Remember though, we're still doing greater than probability. So we have to do one minus the area we get off the Z chart, and that's gonna leave us with a final answer of 0.8212. So what we found out was if we do a sample of 36 
institutions, the probability that they're going to average tuition higher than $26,000 is going to be approximately 82.12%.